right, is everybody ready? Yeah. Hey. Everybody having a good MAGFest? Good MAGFest so far? Uh, did anyone get out to see uh, Vince perform with the Lonely Rolling Stars last night? Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you all for waking up so early to be here. I know this is like early morning MAGFest time. And uh, <clears throat> my name is Jason Napolitano. I work with Vince and his writing partner, Kenny, a little bit on developer relations and um, been pushing for years to get Vince out to perform and come talk to you guys. So we did the performance last night. We got the uh, Q&A for you right here and maybe even a little uh, musical request thing for you guys. And um, then there's an autograph session later today at 11.30 to 12.30. <coughs> so um, I imagine most of you in here know who Vince is, uh, at least his works. Um, he's best known for Rocky IV and Transformers the movie from 1986. But what you might not know is that he's actually worked on a lot of video games as well, um, including Gran Turismo. He's done a really excellent arrangement of Moon Over the Castle for that series. Um, he's worked on Angry Birds Transformers, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutants in Manhattan, um, Transformers Devastation, um, Saturday Morning RPG. So we just want to be here and turn it over to Vince to take your guys' questions. I have a microphone here. I'm going to walk down the aisle and um, just hand this to anybody who has a question for Vince. I'll let you say a few words if you'd like. Sure. Thank you, everyone, for being there last night. And, uh, it, it was a very special experience for me. And honest to God, the nicest bunch of people I think I've ever met. Um, certainly the most enthusiastic audience that I've ever played for. And uh, uh, it's just a pleasure to be here. It was a pleasure to be invited to be here. And I hope to come back, you know, future years. Uh, and um, Chris from Lonely Rolling Stars was kind enough to bring his keyboard here. Uh, Jason said something about taking requests. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> you, you can try, but I, I could just play for you at some point uh, during this session. And, but um, I'm open to any questions, any comments anybody has. And uh, because I'm a rock musician. You have to speak up, use the microphone so I can hear what you're saying clearly. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Uh, but again, I just want to say thank you so much for having me here. And uh, it was a very, very special experience for me last night. I wish I, wish I could do it again right now, actually. <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's prepared for this for... Uh, months and 35 minutes it's over you know so um, that's why I, I hope I can come back very soon so open up to uh, any questions uh, can we do like a maybe if anybody has questions or there are a lot of people and I can just bring it to you yeah let's do a single file line in the middle and I'll just hand it to the person mm -hmm. oh, thanks. Uh, hey uh, I'm a Rocky fan, and um, the song from 85, uh, Hearts on Fire, that you did with uh, the Beaver Brown band, or John Cafferty, uh, uh, I wanted to know the likelihood of <laughs> um, you remastering that song. I know you worked on parts of it, maybe not. Um, you talk about Hearts on Fire? Yeah. From Rocky. Um, you know, it should be remastered. It absolutely should. Uh, yeah. there, are, there are no plans at the moment to mm -hmm. do that. But um, at some point, not only remastering, I might, I might want to recut the song mm -hmm. um, with different musicians and uh, update it a little bit, I guess you'd say. But no, there's no plans to remaster that particular piece of music. Right yeah, now. I was wondering the likelihood because um, at Movie to soundtrack, sometimes with these old movies, there's a certain difference in quality that's noticeable only to like yeah. real fans. Um, yeah, it's quite uh, different. When you, when you hear it in the movie, it's kind of, um, Rocky has this kind of punchy sound to it. The, the, the drums, they sound really, really good. I've always right. tried to get percussion that sounds like Rocky, but when you hear it on the soundtrack, 
it's a big piece of crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's I, it as a is. as a weird sound fanatic, yeah, I was. Um, hope, yeah, that's that's just my one hope is that. Um, okay. I'm really happy we got the soundtrack remastered. You're full. Um, music I am too. Intrado did fire, a great yeah. job. That's um that's definitely one of my top 10 um, training songs. And, um, it it would have been nice to put Hearts on Fire on that. It would yeah. have been, uh, I, but they, they said no, just the instrumental score, that's all we're interested in mm -hmm. for that release. Yeah. But thank you for saying yeah, that. thank you. Is the difference between the, uh, the original soundtrack that was released by whatever One more time, I can't hear you. Was there any difference between the Entrada release and the 80s release of the soundtrack? Did you, were you able to update anything for the Entrada release to kind of um, address some of the things he was talking about? The difference between... The soundtrack that came out in the 80s? Yeah. And the Entrada re-release that just came out? Um, yeah, what is the difference? Uh, well, certainly the movie versions uh, of everything are different than the original. I did the demos for... Um, Rocky IV before the movie was even shot. So training montage and war from that uh, were not even, sh they, they were done before the movie was even started production. So what I had to do is take those pieces of music and adapt them to the picture. And um, I'll tell you a funny story about that. <clears throat> I didn't realize, my manager didn't tell me, nobody told me this, that uh, they tried to adapt the record version to the movie and they cut it up and they edited it and it just musically wasn't making any sense. I said, I need to recut it. And they were saying, oh, okay. Not telling me that I'm the one that's responsible for paying for that. So I got my first royalty check from Rocky IV and there was $15,000 deducted for the remake of Training Montage. And I called my manager, I said, what? And he said, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you. So um, maybe in retrospect, I should have just let them do it. But I really, you know, it musically didn't make enough sense, the way they cut the music into the picture. So I, I really, I'm glad, other than the money, I'm glad that I had a chance to redo it. And it was a challenge, you know, that whole beginning section with uh, the, the icicles falling off the, uh, you know, the cabin, I guess. Good you, stuff. It yeah. always gets me in the mood to I, I love train. that section of the music, yeah. too. You know, that's not on the, the original version. So I think it was worth the money and the time. Well, so thank thanks. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, just a, a comment and then a question. Okay. Um, in 1986, I was nine years old, sitting in a movie theater, watching Transformers the movie with my cousin, and when the death of Optimus Prime mm -hmm. happened and that music happened, um, I will always have the memory of him bawling at his seat going, don't die off oh. the Prime. Oh. And a big part of that was the music. I bought that soundtrack on Thank you. record and then I bought it again on cassette and now I have it, the, the anniversary edition on, uh, on CD. So I've, I've bought all the versions. Um, could you have imagined when you were doing a soundtrack for a, a, just a little cartoon that was being that uh, was going to be a movie in '86 that, very, that people a, would still be putting it out there, and the Blu-ray came out, and I've seen your I interview in no, that. I had no idea when I did that. It was a job to me. I didn't know anything about Transformers, and didn't see the TV series. Hadn't seen the TV series, um, and you know. I mean, honestly, at that point, it was a job that I was hired to do. Not that I was just taking it lightly, sure. but I had no idea it was going to turn in. In fact, uh, the, the guy who organized BotCon, the very first organizer, was a guy named Glenn Hallett. And he called me in 1997. Now, this is 11 years after the movie came out. He said, I want you to come to a Transformers convention. I said, what? Transformers convention, you know. I hadn't heard anything about Transformers since I did the job. And the movie was in and out of the theaters in what, two, two, three weeks or something. So I said, Glenn, I said, yeah, I'd be happy to, but what, what is a Transformers convention? And he said, you gotta come and see it. And he said, there's gonna be, a, uh, you, you'll be surprised at the number of people that remember your music. And it was a very surreal experience. I went to Rochester, New York, and uh, I, I walked in the, the building, the hotel, 
and there was a line, and I honestly didn't know what it was, I thought it was to get in the convention itself, that it was going out the door, around the block outside, and I walked in and I said to Glenn, I said, wow, I said, there's a lot of people coming to this convention. He said, this is all for you. <laughs> and I said, no, no. And he said, I'm telling you. And, and he stood back like this when I was doing the, my first panel, like this. And, you know, he was, he was smiling because he could see that I was so surprised. Um, so, no, I had no idea it was going to turn into the cult that it did. And so I'm so happy that it did, obviously. It's, you know, here we are. 31 years later, 32 years later. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, Vince. I know you. I know you. This is the guy that sang Dare and played drums last night. From Lonely Rolling Stars. That was fun. I kind of wish we did the touch, too. Yeah. Oh. I can't sing the touch as well, though. So I can't either. <laughs> So I have like a two-tiered question. Okay. Um, one is, did you always know that you wanted to be a musician, uh, like as a career and as like a lifestyle, I guess? And For if you weren't being a musician now, what do you think you'd be doing and what would you like to be doing? <laughs> oh boy. I have no idea, you know? Um, I was, my earliest memory of being involved in music was five years old. I went to a Catholic school, one Catholic grade school, kindergarten actually, and there was this nun that stood about four feet tall. She was a piano teacher, and she was about 110 years old, and uh, she had this little iron bar, and it was the traditional, if I made a mistake, whack. If I did well, I got a gold star on the, on the book. And, um, you know, from that time on, I, I loved music. I don't know, I, don't, I can't trace it where I first learned to love music, but from learning to play the piano at five years old, I thought this is something really cool. The thing that really changed my life that solidified my decision to pursue a career in music was when I was, <clears throat> excuse me, 14 years old, my brother took me to my first rock concert and it was a band called Emerson, Lake, and Palmer oh. from the 70s. Nice. And, um, yeah. And I, first of all, it was my first rock concert, so I didn't know anything about a rock concert experience by itself. You know, and I walked in, and I saw these floor-to-ceiling speakers, and I, was, I got scared. I thought, oh, my God, what is this? Am I going to be, are my eardrums just going to explode and blood coming out my, my head? Uh, and then my brother said, Dan, just, you know, just go with it. You're, you're going you're gonna to be amazed. So the first band comes out. It was called Dr. Hook and the Medicine Show. And uh, they had one hit called Sylvia's Mother back then, I remember. They did their thing. And it was, it was loud, but it wasn't uncomfortable. Then they had, you know, a half an hour to set up Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. And I heard these sounds coming from backstage, these, these massive electronic sounds that I had never heard before. And... Uh, Man, this this is otherworldly. So the, they announce the band. The curtain rises up. There's three people on this stage, and on the left hand side, which was where I was seated, was this guy, and he had he had a rack of keyboards on his right, and on his left, and he was looking at the audience and doing this, uh -huh. and playing very complicated stuff with both hands that are completely separate. And he's looking out at the audience, you know, like he's doing this. It was from that moment that I knew what I wanted to do with my life. And, and not, not from a, an ego standpoint, but the music that he was playing was so, it touched me to the core. And I thought, this is really what I want to do with my life. And that was the moment, 14 years old. That's awesome. Did I answer your, was there another part of your question? Basically, like... Oh, what it's, would it's I be doing It's basically like now? actor's studio. Like, what job other than yours would you like to attempt? What, say again, what? What, what job or profession other than yours would you like to attempt? Uh, Jason, c can you help me out one more time? Just say it a little louder. You know what? I'd love to have the speaker a little close to me. Is, there, is this monitor on over here on stage by any chance?
is on. It is on. Yo. <laughs> See if that helps. Sorry. Yeah. The question is. Uh, oh, there you are. Yeah. Which which job or profession other than yours would you like to? Ah, uh, right, like right. Try anything. What else would I like to do? Um. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I've been doing music for so long. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, that probably means you're doing the right thing. Yeah. You're I, in the right field. I, I think I was born to do this, and I've never even given thought to what else would I do. I, I probably I, should have. In fact, my parents were always like, they wanted me to be a music teacher. and something to fall back on, something that has a guaranteed income, you know, although I don't even know what that means these days, if you have a guaranteed income, if you're a music teacher, you know. Um, I don't, I, I uh, tried to teach my own daughters how to play piano, and I was, I was brutal. I mean, I was, um, I was hard on them, because I wanted them to be as perfectionistic as me. And I, I actually drove them to tears a couple of times. I didn't mean to. I just, you know, I wanted them to want to be great. And it was the wrong approach. I turned them on to better piano teachers. And so, no, I can't picture being a piano teacher or a professor in, in uh, college or anything like that. So, yeah, music is it. I think you picked the right career path. Oh, thank you. Hey Vince, my name is uh, George Kitchen. I am uh, from this area. Um, so Dolph Lundgren and I, we were talking a few months ago. Um, he, I'll, I'll rephrase that. He, uh, he made a tweet and I pressed the like button. And uh, it, he uh, was talking about the new Creed 2 movie coming out. And of course you're probably not composing the soundtrack for that, which is too bad. But uh, it made me go onto the internet and I looked you up and I, I was wondering what you were doing with your life at the moment. And uh, I saw that you were at MAGFest, and I, I come here every year, and I, I compose music now. And I'm also a personal trainer. My twin brother and I, we, uh, he's, he's in the back somewhere, but... Oh, he's right there. Uh, <laughs> he's not important. He's my younger twin brother. Uh, but we've been doing personal training for 15 to 20 years now, and the, the idea that Rocky IV, and as a composer, you, you always want your legacy to go on. And I say this very humbly, because my composition career is a few puzzle apps that most six-year-olds get bored after 30 minutes, but uh, everybody wants to be remembered for something. And the children that, I'm 38 years old now, and some of the children that we train, they have Rocky IV on their, on their iPhones and their iPods, and, and it's, it's incredible that the soundtrack continues to continue on and not be outdated, because most music from the 80s gets outdated fairly quickly. And, um, so now my brother got it, and I, we got into it, and then during our training sessions, not only do we have the Rocky IV soundtrack, uh, we also have Transformers, we also have the Saturday RPG battle theme, yeah. that some of our more manlier men really get pumped up and hurt themselves trying to do too much squats because it's so inspirational. Um, <laughs> but I would say, of Rocky IV's music, everybody always talks about the training theme, and. Uh, war, but it also Ivan Drago's theme song is an extremely intense piece, and it's it's so pro-Russia. I mean, I felt like we were at war with Russia when I was listening to it, and then you really exemplified what Russia was. And so, in a way, you kind of represented Russia during the Cold War uh, in, in a small way. It was a really cool theme. I just want to say that it was I, as a composer, I really appreciate the theme. But to, to get to the question, uh, how does it feel, first of all, to have soundtracks that continue to age well, which to me is a compliment, and at the same time as a composer, I made a, a video game for a company in Gaithersburg, and I, I made a battle theme in the game, which sort of, I don't want to say stole, but it sort of emulates the style of war and Rocky, so in that way, my career, as humble as it is in the composition world, I've honored you a little bit in that aspect. But at the same time, how does it feel to know that generations are continuing to listen to the music and, and that it's not outdated anymore? Uh, first of all, great comments. Thank you so much for all that. Um, how does it feel? I, I, I am, I constantly am surprised at all these years later that that music still holds up and you know it was proven last night in playing that music for a live audience which was the first time thank you 
That was the first time I played with a live band. Uh, you know, I usually use backing tracks when I do this. It's a more controllable situation, but a live band, there's that, there's that uh, organic give and take, and it, it was just such a pleasure to play. I mean, it's the first time I've performed war ever with, with a band. And as I was playing it on stage last night, I was, think, I was actually thinking, this still holds up, you know, and, and, and playing it loud with a band and, and, and uh, that give and take and that live thing. I mean, there, there were some rough spots, you know, but it, the energy was just incredible. And, uh, how, you know, I am constantly in shock at how much people still pay attention to that, Transformers, and even some of the music from Staying Alive, believe it or not, when uh, uh, there's a song that I did called Far From Over. I don't know if anybody knows that song, but... Uh, uh, That was a poor rendition, but, uh, uh, you know, people still play that. Now, that song doesn't, in my opinion, didn't age too well, as well as the Rocky and Transformer stuff. But there was a time when that song, they, they, the movie company told me this anyway, where the, the sales, the box office sales had started to wane, and that song came out and boosted the movie again, which... When, you, when you, you take the fact that the Bee Gees were on that soundtrack and they were so big on the first soundtrack, and here we did, we come out, we're basically nobody. I mean, Frank Stallone obviously has the last name Stallone, but as an artist, he wasn't well known at all. So, and as a writer, that was my first job. So it was, um, it was surreal to hear that our song became the, the element that pushed the movie, you know. So yeah, it's it's a wonderful thing to have that music being held up for so long. Oh, great. Well, I'll just close with one last thing. I just want to say thank thank you to uh, two 38-year-old twin brothers who, uh, the other day, he grabbed me and said, listen to the soundtrack from Angry Birds from Vince DiCola. And it made me sentimental a little bit because at 38 years old, Rocky was uh, part of my childhood. And I remember dancing as a seven-year-old kid to the music in the basement. And it created a, a sentimental feeling of childhood memories. So you'll always be tied to my, my childhood. So uh, thank you for that, Vince. I appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> I'll start by saying, Ba weep, grog na weep, nanny bong. Transformers <laughs> Universal Greetings. I can't talk that language, but... <laughs> Guys, I've been a fan of your work, especially in the uh, dark horror to action from Unicron's theme, yeah. from the Autobot City battles, and your work in Transformers Devastation took me back. <laughs> But among all the projects you've done, um, if you had to play favorites, which one would you say has been your personal? Out of Transformers or out of Rocky? Out Avengers? of all of them. Hmm. Favorite. Or I one mean, you had you know, the most Immediately what comes to mind is training montage, only because it's been so good to me for all these years. It keeps getting licensed time and time again. Uh, musically, the, 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 my favorite piece of music has not come out yet. I, I'm working on it now. It's a 55-minute piece of music, and it's a progressive rock suite, and it, it, it incorporates the best of progressive rock and cinematic, and um, it's going to be released for sure this year. Uh, I've been talking about it for years, and it's been in... I, I, it took me 12 years to write this piece of music. Uh, it started out as an eight-minute piece of music, and it just gradually you know, just grew, and I knew, it was like, I reached a point years, years, years and years later where, okay, I know it's done now, you know. Um, watch for that on my Facebook page, you know, it, it's probably going to be under the heading of Tacola Perry Project. Uh, my partner, Doan Perry, is a drummer for Jeth was the drummer for Jethro Tull for 30 years. He wrote the lyrics, I wrote the music, we both played I, I did all the orchestration, all the, all the keyboards, all the orchestra parts, bass parts, all that stuff, and he played drums. And it's by far his best performance ever, and, and mine too. So that's my favorite piece. I know you haven't heard it yet, but hopefully this year you will hear that. But of the stuff that exists, yeah, probably training montage. Definitely have to keep an ear out for that one. It's, it's going to be awesome, I can tell already. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.
Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is James Kirk. Hi, James. Uh, that's real name. Yeah, not, not kidding. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it was my dad's fault. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, I didn't think I'd get the chance to do this ever. Uh, Transformers the movie was the first movie that my father took me to that I was able to sit through. Yeah. Uh, and I chucked popcorn at the screen when Optimus died, and he had to explain to me why that wasn't okay. Uh, so, years later, uh, last year, uh, he passed away. Yeah. And uh, the day that he died, um, my Amazon Music, with over like 300 tracks that it could have picked, plays the death of Optimus Prime while I'm driving. And uh, I had a lot of really good memories come back. Uh, and that was because of the, the music that you wrote. Really? So um, I don't really have a question. I just wanted That's to say okay. thank you. That was a great comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very touching. Ah, I remember you. Yeah. I remember you from yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I apologize if someone asked this already, but it's kind of a stupid question. In the track, Polly's Robot from yeah. Rocky IV, <laughs> um, uh, who did the voice that says, Happy Birthday, Polly? Because it's that on was, the soundtrack. That was so. my co-producer, Ed Frugge, uh from Lake Charles, Louisiana. <laughs> we had him go out in the studio and just do that and... We, we electronically screwed it up, and mm -hmm. yeah, that was him. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you. I yeah. just wanted to know if it was like a synthesized voice or an actual yeah, voice. Yeah. That's you know, awesome. The, the scene that jumped the shark in the series. Uh, <laughs> I disagree. Uh, hello. Yeah, I just, um, you, I actually know, like, um, you say that Far From Over, right? Yes. Okay, because actually, I think that's probably the first thing I heard from you too. Because like I know it's like sports segment of like this like news cha like the news station like um, I'm sorry, the news program of this channel I watched back when I was a kid. They I guess they used like the synth uh, section from Far From Over as like the theme song for their sports one too, and that's been in my that was like in my head for like a probably a good decade or so until I found out it was like from you know that Frank Stallone song, and right. thought it was pretty awesome when I learned that then. That was my first job in 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 show business, really. And it was a good one, too. I, I like it, at least. I mean, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, my question is, uh, do you have like, any uh, favorite movie scores or, other than your own? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there's a guy named John Powell who did uh, all the Born Identity movies. It's the best, to me, the best action score stuff. It really changed the whole uh, landscape of action scoring. Um, it was a great... Uh, combination of rock and classical and the old elements versus new electronic elements. Um, my favorite horror score is uh, the, the movie 1408, and I, boy, I'm blanking on the composer now. Um, go buy that soundtrack. It is, even without watching the movie, it'll scare the hell out of you. I mean, if you, it, it is so, and again, it's the, a great marriage of modern versus you know, the old stuff, traditional stuff. Um, it might have been Mel Marco Beltrami, I can't remember. Anyway, uh, that and the, the guy that scored, um, let me think now, it was, uh, Murder in the First. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that movie about Alcatraz. Uh, it's one of the most moving, melodic movie scores. You know, uh, people think, oh, Vince writes all this action stuff, and I love, melodic, dramatic, uh, stuff that moves me, you know? Um, which was why I was able to create Death of Optimus Prime, because, again, I wasn't as tied to these characters as you all were, but it was a death scene, and I knew it was a big death scene, and I knew it was important, and I could just draw from the dramatic uh, experiences that I've had, so... Uh, yeah, that, that score to Murder in the First was phenomenal. Uh, and of course, the traditional. I love, um, I love what Hans Zimmer did. I usually, <laughs> Hans is brilliant. I thought that for a long time he was copying himself and everything just sounded the same. But then came Interstellar and um, the, uh, the, the most recent one. What was the most, uh, the sci-fi one? Which one? 
Um, I think that was it, yeah. Um, I thought he was brilliant. I thought those scores were brilliant. Uh, Dunkirk, I thought he did a great job on that. He stepped aside from his normal thing on that, and uh, I loved it, yeah. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> oh, it was hey, how are you? <laughs> I had a question about the process of mastering your instruments. Um, I understand you went to university for percussion, right? So while you were studying, did you ever hit sort of a, a plateau of skill or talent that uh, it was just difficult for you to hit the next level of whatever that may be, or drums, piano, everything you know? Could you give any advice to a fellow musician on hitting their own kind of plateau and keeping motivated as they try to get to the next level? You know, I've been fortunate in any time I've had uh, an opportunity to write something I've never had writer's block. I've never experienced that. Um, Lucky man. I have plateaued in a sense that, um, you know, especially in, in writing this piece of music for 12 years, it was like somewhere in the middle of that. It's like, I know this isn't finished, but I'm not sure what to do to finish it. And that was a scary feeling. But the difference was for me, when I go to a piano, and that's how I write. I start with a piano 99% uh, of the time. If I'm writing a piece of music, I'll tape everything that I'm writing day by day, and I'll end up maybe using 35% uh, at the end of the day, the, the thing that ends. Now, in Transformers, I didn't have that opportunity. I had to move very quickly. It was six weeks to do the whole score. I mean, write it, record it, master it, the whole deal. So in that sense, it was good. I didn't even have a chance to have writer's block. It was like, bam, you got to deliver here, you know. Um, but on this long piece of music, so every time I went to the piano, except for maybe there was a one-year span where I did feel like I, I was plateauing, everything that I wrote ended up in, in the final version. I would say 85% of it, and that's never happened to me before. And it was just like, you know, I was definitely channeling and divine inspiration. And, uh, uh, but as, what advice do I have for people that have that type of problem? Um, uh, you know, if you're under a deadline, you don't have the opportunity. You, you just have to find the inspiration somewhere. But if you are just writing music for the en enjoyment of writing music, let that process take its toll, I mean, take its path, rather. Uh, don't push yourself, you know? Okay, so don't sit at the piano for a couple days. Sometimes that even breaks the, the block, uh, the plateau, you know, that raises it up again. Because then you come back a week later and you're, for some reason, more motivated, more inspired, and then it starts flowing again. So have patience with that plateau, it will pass. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. I have uh, two comments, or two, two comments and then two questions. Okay. First one is, uh, I had a friend approach me, I was doing some stuff with him musically once, and we got to talking about you know, shared musical interests, and I talked about my love of Transformers, the movie, in terms of inspiration and music. And he says, I could never get into it, it just seemed like one long music video. And it took me years to think about the reaction I was, like, I was processing, I'm like, how, how could he not like it? And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, he's right, best music video ever. Uh. <laughs> uh, and the other comment was, is I still have the signed copy that I got from BotCon years uh. ago, years and years ago. And I used to go to sleep to the music to Transformers. It would help, you know, de-stress me from a day. It's really? really awesome. So my questions are, uh, among the bands that you've heard in music, either bands or favorite songs, what are the best things you've heard in the last 20 years? Mm. Because there's a lot of music that I don't relate to from the last Same, years. Same, yeah, yeah. Um, most of it's probably movie music. Yeah. You know, uh, like I said, some of the things that I mentioned already. Um, there's a there's an artist. There is a prog rock artist that I really, really respect, and he's one of the most prolific artists and songwriters that I've ever heard. It's a guy named Stephen Wilson. He used to be with a band uh, called Porcupine Tree. Ah, there are people that know. 
And awesome. um, I just can't believe the work, the amount of, the body of work this guy continues to create every year. That, that's probably my most inspirational, motivational music that I've heard in the last 20 years. That's awesome. It's funny you mentioned that. Actually, I had a score I had to do recently where someone like pointed at him, like, do what he does. I'm like, I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, my other question is, when can I buy what I heard last night? Say again. When can I buy what I heard last night? <laughs> I would love a recording of the live album. Are you guys planning to do like... The live album. It's all available on Twitch. Is it, it's available for purchase now? No, it's available for stream. The stream is on Twitch. The stream's on Twitch. Are you guys planning to do a studio version? Yeah. Oh. That would be nice. Please? That, that would be nice. Let's make that happen, George, would you? Thank you. <laughs> Talk to this. Jason should work on that. <laughs> um, I remember you from yesterday. Yes, thank you. Once again, thank you for coming. It's My amazing. pleasure. I said, yeah, I said before, but I never thought I'd be able to see you play live. And that's a gift to all of us, and I think we all appreciate that. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be able to play it live. Yeah, you guys killed it. You were awesome. I couldn't have, couldn't have done it without yeah, these guys. Yeah, everyone was great. Um, growing up as a kid, you know, we all played video games, and whether we knew it or not, in video games they play so many different genres of music, and we all grew up enjoying these, and now we can appreciate the music because of that. And I would say that for you and my history with that, I, I love pro prog rock, and Me too. It's, it's thanks to you because when I saw the movie, I didn't know I was listening to it, but it, was, it seeped into my brain oh, and now great. I, I, I can't that. get it out. I love that. <laughs> but my question was that uh, uh, you worked on Transformers Devastation and I really love that soundtrack, but I was curious to know what that process was like if you were involved with the Japanese composers at all in that or you know, if it was a separate thing? My involvement in that was almost an afterthought. Uh, the, the producers came uh, to me and said, could you do a new, they, all they wanted was a new theme song, a, a new vocal theme song. Um, we were gonna do that song last night, but because we did Angry Birds Transformers theme, which was another vocal, you know, it's really hard when somebody says, can you do another Transformers theme? I mean, you know, more than meets the eye is, is, is permeating my brain, so I don't, I don't, it was hard to come up with something, and, and they wanted it to have those elements, for the elements from the original song, but they needed it to be different. So their first uh, approach to me was, can you write a theme song? So Kenny and I wrote the theme song to uh, Transformers Devastation, um, and um, they loved it so much, they said, oh, we, have, we already have a score, but can you score like eight key scenes in this? In that's this? what I was wondering about. And, and it's not released, it's never been out on a soundtrack. Yeah, that sucks. Um, <laughs> there is a, a CD for sale here that Kenny and I released, it's called Of Two Minds. And there's some, I believe there's one piece from Transformers Devastation on there. There's also a medley that I did uh, updating all the highlights from my transformer score in a like a more orchestral fashion mm. that's on that record and um, uh, but the process was basically they were so nice to say we love this vocal theme that you did now do some instrumental stuff for us I don't know if it's ever going to come out other than what's on this one record that I just released but um, I'm really proud of that music too we did it we did a I mean, there was another composer, I can't remember the name of the band. Uh, they did a great job. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, the nice thing is, even though we came late to the party, so to speak, our music fits with what they did, in my opinion. So, yeah, that was how that came about. That's great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, Vince. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say I was very pleasantly surprised to see you come up and perform uh, Mario Kart Double Dash with Lonely Rolling Stars. So I was curious, like, was that a suggestion on their part, or did something? Were you drawn to that? It was a suggestion song? on their part, and okay. and I'm glad they picked one of the easier songs that they do, because <laughs> you know I was able to l actually learned it. Um, it wasn't on the plane. It was it was like the day before I flew, and I I listened to it and charted it out real quick, 
And because it's a great song, it's it was fun to learn. You know, it wasn't like oh god, I'm gonna like they're they learning my material. I I can't even imagine what they were going through. You know, I didn't have to go through that to learn their their material. I put them I put them through the paces. And now that I know how good they play, I said if I come back and I got to use them to play my music again, I'm gonna give them even more difficult stuff next time. So so. Thank you. Yeah. So that was an awesome set. Thank you. And uh, you mentioned that your first gig in showbiz was working with Frank Stallone. How did you get that gig? I was playing in a club out in Los Angeles called The Red Onion. It's a Mexican restaurant that has live music, that had live music at the time. <clears throat> and I saw this guy walk in one night. I was up on stage playing top 40 music with a band. and. Man, he looked familiar. And I, I couldn't place him, you know, it took me a little while. Then on the break, he approached me. And when he approached me and I saw him up close, I thought, no, it's, it's got to be a relation to Sylvester Stallone. It was his brother. And uh, he said, listen, I have a band together that plays, that I'm playing my own material. I, would, I need a keyboard player. Would you like to play with me? That was my first offer to play original music ever. And I said, sure, I would love to. And he took me out into his car and he played me some music on a little cassette. And I really related to it. It was uh, some really great music. And um, uh, so he said, listen, come down to rehearsal, the next rehearsal I have, audition. You know, he says, I hope you don't mind auditioning because I'm, I'm listening to a couple of different keyboard players. I said, absolutely. So I went down, played um, a couple songs with, he and his band, with him and his band, and he loved it and hired me to play. And it was just, first it was a band, then it was just Frank and myself playing like coffee shops and stuff. And, and believe it or not, I really loved that. It was, it was, we were doing stuff like James Taylor and mellow stuff and um, folksy stuff. You know, he played acoustic guitar and I would play keyboards. We both sang and uh, we would harmonize. And I have to tell this story because it's really, it really was the start of the whole movie thing for me. We were rehearsing, his brother got Frank, uh, to rehearse on the Paramount Studios lot in a sound stage. So this was like you know, really cool, you know, go, go to a sound stage to rehearse. We were down there rehearsing one day and Sylvester, and this was back in, in the early 80s and he was really, really huge at that time. So he came with his entourage. There was about four or five people with him, body, bodyguards and all this stuff. And during our break, Sylvester took his brother Frank aside, and I was, you know, playing and practicing, whatever, kind of trying to listen in on what the conversation was. Anyway, uh, Sylvester came and said hi to all of us, and, and you know, Frank introduced us, and, and then he left with his entourage. And after the rehearsal, Frank said, my brother just told me that he's directing and writing the sequel to Saturday Night Fever. And he said, he, he asked me if I would write some songs for it. And Frank said to me, he said, would you want to write with me? And I said, are you kidding me? You know, this is a golden opportunity. And I had never written anything before. I mean, anything like that before. So uh, long story short, we wrote five pieces of music and recorded them professionally. Frank paid for all the recordings. He took them over to his brother. His brother hated all five of them. Just <laughs> out and out hated them. And God bless Frank, he had the fortitude to say, you know what, I know what my brother's missing. And can I come over to your house? I had a, I was, my wife and I were living in a house with two other couples and we had this garage, everybody was musicians, so we had this garage with a bunch of musical equipment in it. Frank came over with a little boom box and he said, let's just write something that's fast. He said, none of the songs that we've done so far we're fast. Let's do something high energy. And I swear in 15 minutes we had... And Frank recorded it on this boombox with him singing not even, he hadn't had any lyrics, he was just singing na-na vocal melody. And he said, I'm gonna take this over to my brother. I said, no, no. I said, this is, you know, 
not a professional recording. And he said, no, I have a feeling. My wife and I went out to dinner that night and we were staying in one room of this house, a little white answering machine there. We came home from dinner and there was this message from Sylvester Stallone. And he said, Vinny, home run. And that was the start of it. Now, the best part of that, the best part of that was he loved that song so much he went back and listened to the other five and took them all in the movie and then had us write another two songs in addition to that. So we had seven songs on the Staying Alive soundtrack. Awesome. Thank it. you. I'd like three quick questions. One, what was your favorite project? Not like a song, but like in general, a project was it Rocky or Transformers or like a video game. What was like your least favorite? And is there a project that you wish you had the opportunity to work on? Uh, I'm sorry, the question again. Um, first one was, what was your favorite project? What do I think of? Favorite project. Oh, my favorite project? Yeah. Um, you know, Rocky IV, because, like I said, with Transformers, I wasn't familiar with the character, so it didn't mean that much to me. But Rocky IV, back then in 1986, it was Sylvester Stallone. Um, it was uh, an otherworldly experience, and it was, it was, it, I never thought I would get the job, honest to God. My, my manager was the music supervisor, so he would feed me um, storylines ahead of time and this whole time I'm writing in my little apartment I'm writing train montage and war and all this stuff thinking oh, I'm never gonna get this job you know so when my manager called me after and I do have to tell this do we have time for me to tell one little story here 13 minutes. Um, the way that happened was um, Robin Garb, who was the music supervisor, and he was also my manager. He was Frank Stallone's manager. That's how I met him. Uh, he told me later that he took a break on the Rocky IV production. He found out when Sly was going to be in his trailer, and Robin had this little Walkman cassette player, and he had a pair of headphones, and he said, I sat Sly down on the chair, and I didn't tell him anything. I said, just put the headphones on. I want you to listen to something. And he said, two minutes in, Sylvester Stallone jumped out of his chair. He said, who the F is this? And he said, that's the guy that wrote with, with your brother and staying alive. He says, that's Vinny? He said, yeah. He said, this guy's got to score the movie. Because I, I had done the training scene. I had done the fight scene and the funeral scene and all that stuff. He said, uh, it just so happened that Bill Conti, who had scored the first three movies, he and Sly had a falling out for Rocky IV, so he wasn't going to be scoring it. So it was a matter of the perfect time, perfect place. And the way Robin did that was masterful. You know, I'm not telling him anything, just put the headphones on his ears, play the music, and, and he loved it. And I'll tell you another thing that was great about that. They weren't going to put my name uh, in the paper as a composer because I was a nobody. And Sylvester said, absolutely not, put his name in the paper. He was responsible for that. And that was a big thing. I mean, a composer credit in the paper and on, in, you know, on a poster, that was a big thing. So um, now I will tell you one other funny story. Uh, it's the other side of that. Uh, closer to the end of the production, they had a uh, screening in the Par on the Paramount lot I'm sorry, MGM lot. And Sylvester came with his wife, Brigitte Nielsen at the time, and her family and his family and all the producers were there and all the, uh, the you know, Sylvester Stallone, all the editors and the team of uh, mixers. That's what they were really, they were doing a final mix, audio mix. And uh, so the, I, I watched from the back of the theater, I watched, um, Sylvester in the middle of the theater just to see if I could sense his body language, you know, when he would listen to the music. This was the first time he heard most of the music. At the end of the movie, he stands up and he was looking around and he's looking around for somebody. Didn't know it was me. And they finally landed on me and he didn't look happy at all. 
I thought, oh my God. He comes up the aisle. This is really a surreal, funny story. He comes up the aisle and proceeded to lay into me about the fight scene. And he said the words, what the F did you do to that music? And I, again, this was my first big job scoring a movie. And he's one of my heroes in uh, acting, you know. So I was shaken. I was shaken a little bit. I, I don't think I showed him that, but inside I was very nervous. I said, well, I was trying to get to the bottom of what did you not like about it. He said, I don't know. I just, it was, it's not like the demo, is what he said. Now, remember I said I wrote the demo before the movie was even shot. So you figure you take a four minute piece of music, there's a seven minute fight scene, well I'm gonna have to add music to it, I'm gonna have to elongate it. And he was fumbling around to tell me what he hated about it, okay? And I said, I'll fix it, whatever it is, I can fix it, we still have time. And he was so angry that he didn't, now his wife is standing next to him, behind Sylvester and his wife are the Producers of the movie, Charoff Winkler, these are the bosses of everybody, including Stallone. They're saying, they're behind Stallone while he's ranting and raving, and they're going like this to me, like, don't listen to him. Don't pay any attention. <laughs> now, here's the real kicker. Here's the real kicker. Brigitte Nielsen knows nothing about music, right? Speaks up and she says, Sly, maybe it just needs more trumpets. Now, I had about 50,000 trumpets on this. It's a Rocky theme. I had 50,000 trumpets on this thing. And, and he goes, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> so I went in the next day. I put, there was a synthesizer called an emulator. It was a ver one of the first samplers. I mean, I put one tr solo trumpet added to the 50,000 that were already there, and he loved it. <laughs> so what I found out the next day was that, I don't mean to speak badly of him, this happens a lot with movie stars, they like to intimidate sometimes. They like to feel, even though they're more important than God sometimes, they like to feel even more important. He has a, a habit of picking one person on every production. I found this out from the editor that worked with him on all the movies. And he came over to me, luckily, right away. His name is Don Zimmerman. He said, Vince, don't pay any attention to what just happened. Don't take it personally. He takes one person on every production, picks on them right at this point of the movie, the production, and just acts like he knows it all about every aspect of making a film. And it didn't mean anything. And it, it was proven the next day when I put that one trumpet on, you know. And he said, ah, that's exactly what it needed. I don't even think he heard that one extra trumpet. So that was my Rocky IV story. Uh, just one more real quick. Do you have anything you wish you had the opportunity to work on? One more time. Something, a project you wish you had the opportunity to work on? Ooh. I, um, I would like to say Transformers, the live action movie, but I was never even given that opportunity. Uh, I was talking to somebody last night about this. Um, you know, Michael Bay made the decision at the outset. He wanted that, those movies to be a completely separate animal from the animated movie, and I respect that. That doesn't mean I couldn't have written music that was different than I wrote for the cartoon, you know, the animated. Um, and I really, really took it hard that I wasn't at least considered for part of that. Uh, you know, if one piece of music I would have loved to have had in that, in that first, in any of the movies. So, you know how many sequels there are. So every time the sequel would be made, I would go through another bout of depression, you know, because I wasn't even considered for it. Um, one more story about uh, uh, a project that came, so to speak, across my desk that I turned down. Uh, my manager brought a videotape to me of this little, uh, she was about 16 at the time, maybe even younger, doing uh, work for Disney. One of the Disney, what was the thing, uh, where all the kids came out of Disney something. Um, and this was this girl with long 
blonde curly hair and she was a really really good singer and she was singing and you know dancing around on stage and and along with this video there was a cassette of of her covering some top 40 songs and she, again really good singer I listened to it and I said Robin I said it's not my thing though and I still maintain that to this day it really wasn't my thing he said are you sure you don't want to just try your hand on one song and producing it you know we'll get her out here come in your studio work with her see how it goes and I said I, I, I think I would be wasting her time and my own I turned out to be Christina Aguilera you know <laughs> So, oh my God. But you know what? It really wasn't my thing, and I would have been doing her an injustice. She ended up with the right people. All right, oh. Thanks. We're, we're close to time. How are we doing? Are we, can we take some more? Just have one quick question. So, sure. uh, I'm a big fan of Transformers, the movie, obviously, as everybody else is here. Um, but I'm also a big fan of G.I. Joe, the movie, which came out, I think, right after Transformers. Yeah, so I'm not movie. really familiar with the music to that, by the way, but yeah. Okay, well, the, my question is, I've heard in some places in the movie, some remnants of the Transformers, the movie soundtrack, like some stuff from like the Autobot versus Decepticon battle. I don't know if you had any role in that or if they just kind of maybe borrowed a little bit from I didn't that. know it till the second. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's a little bit there, but it's not like complete songs, but I just thought that maybe you had something to do with that. It doesn't seem like I'd it. like to think that they were somewhat inspired, maybe, by that, and I've been listening to a lot of stuff. In fact, last night, the band was playing me some material that, uh, of a band called Haken, or Haken, Haken, and um, they did a piece of music that it was an obvious, I was an obvious inspiration, and they even said that, and, but they did it in a really cool way, that it wasn't a, a rip-off, it was an homage to my style. So, it's nice when I hear that people have used my style as an inspiration, you know. All right, well, we're, we're pretty much done on time, so what I think we're going to do is, maybe uh, you can play us off, Vince, with a song. If you want, while, sure. uh, and we, we'll be outside afterwards. If you want to ask more questions, please come up. Uh, there's going to be a signing from 11:30 to 12:30. Yeah. Down in the uh, registration room, there's an autographing area back there. There's merch at Rock Island. We got Transformers, uh, the movie vinyl. We got Rocky IV vinyl. Um, we got Saturday morning RPG soundtracks of Two Minds, which he mentioned, which has the Devastation theme on it, and. Um, and Invincible, an original album by Vince. So that's all at Rock Island. Uh, it'll be available also at the autograph session. Um, thank you all for, for coming. Vince, do you have any closing comments? Can I, can I play something? Yeah, play some. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm just gonna improvise if that's okay. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I don't have time to take requests. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Chris for the keyboard. Thank you.